All right, this is the point where we open up the floor to public comments relating to agenda items. Um, you come to the microphone and state your name and address. Um, and so if we have any public comments relating to the agenda, items on the agenda, please come up. Yeah, I, I, no, no. I know that we, he's, I think there's some latitude. I think, you know, since we spoke about it, Transportation and busing, I think it's fair, so please go ahead. Uh, my name is Quinn Bond. I live over on uh, Prospect Ave over at Booker Um I appreciate the difficulty with construction busing. I grew up in a town that had no busing, so I rode my bike to school. So I get those parts, but that town is vastly different than the routes that are here. Um, you know, I know you mentioned the hazardous routes. Transportation committee is going to be dealing with that. There's a group called Safe Reserve, Safe Routes in New Jersey, out of the Glasgow uh, School of Public um, Policy over at Rutgers. They put out a new kind of document about this several years ago as schools went into this. They discussed some of the options for schools. Um, okay. Um, they talked about some of the options. Milburn's provided safe route maps to the students. I don't believe that there's any safe route maps here. Um, my big question, I, I have another bunch of questions, but I realize we only get to ask one. Does the board provide information to the police departments on the number of students that are going to be walking, riding bikes, or using transportation other than the buses in order to get to school? Because the townships are also responsible for part of the safe routes. If the board's not providing that information, the towns can't provide adequate crossing guards. Over in Clifford Beach, there are no crossing guards. The only crossing guard for Clifford Beach is the crossing guard at Route 35. The thing is, is going from Prospect Ave to that bus, to that crossing guard is not a safe route. There's not sidewalks for the entirety of that for people to go. There's a bus stop on Fairfield and Concourse that's on a blind curve. One of the things for safe routes is that the safe route doesn't cross blind curves. You know, there's a lot of issues with that. You've talked about some of the other issues with the subscription busing. But if you're not talking to the towns, if you're not talking to Aberdeen, if you're not talking to Madawan, if you're not involving the police departments in, you're not allowing them to help us get our kids to school safely. Now, this is an issue. I know that a lot of parents were passionate about it online. This is an issue that I'm going to have to deal with for five years with my two children. I don't want to have to come back here every year for five years. You know, one of the things is, is you can't move to any part of the two towns and not deal with this at some point. Everybody in the two towns is going to have to deal with it. So that seems to be an issue that needs to be dealt with in some appropriate manner. Because obviously the towns can't put sidewalks everywhere. So the other option is to figure out how to bust the kids. Bond, I, I think uh, the couple of things that you brought up with reference to the safe routes uh, study, actually around the same time that there was the DOT study on buses and transportation, there was also that safe schools study that talked about kind of walking distances and encouraging biking and that kind of stuff. Uh, I believe that that report was shared with the committee. I'll make sure of that uh, because I know that I have a copy of it as well. Uh, with reference to your specific question about kind of interaction with the local police department and stuff like that, we definitely did earlier on in the process. And then as the committee kind of comes up to a recommendation with, uh, with the recommendations to the board, uh, we're going to ask that representatives from the traffic division of each of the police departments also be part at that board meeting. Just so like this, the board can also uh, have that, that kind of opportunity to um, digest some of those recommendations with those folks. I, I imagine that not enough information is going back because the crossing guards' locations have not changed over the years. Yeah, and that's the police department. locations need to change with the changes in the student population. Yeah, I, I, I don't I don't want to speak for the police departments in terms of how they designate their resources for crosswalks and, and crossing guards. Um, but I know that that conversation did take place. And based upon the initial kind of assessment that was done last fall, uh, they felt comfortable with with some of those. But I agree with you that if I, I don't know, I don't know if I don't know if they did in order to kind of drive in terms of. 
Oh, no, no, we, we, we share the, the, the information, and they see the volume that comes out of the different developments of kids walking. Uh, but uh, that information is, is definitely available to them in order to kind of support them in, so that this, they can make uh, decisions based upon their staffing needs in terms of that kind of thing. Well, can I, can I ask, since I, I kind of open up latitude, I don't want to go too broad scope. So if you could. All right, I just, we have a follow-up too that you could do that also. The only, um, the other thing is definitely let the police department know. They, they I, I have, exactly, I, I and sh um, we're meet, the transportation committee is meeting tomorrow at 530 if you can get here, if you want to send some. I'll, I'll try, I think 530 is right at the end of the work. Not here, I hear you, I hear you. And if you can share a document. My, my one question is within that same group, um, I believe it was Ventnor, but there's probably some other districts that have done the same. The superintendent and some of the administrative staff went out and walked those routes to determine both the safety, looking at the hazards, as well as the amount of time that takes. Some of those students that have to walk through high school, it's a 40 minute walk to them. Yeah. So, so um, our previous security director, Mr. Opegard, actually used to do that on a fairly frequent basis when we got those requests. Um, and consequently, he used to be the liaison as it relates to um, some of the other parties that are involved in the municipalities, including the train folks, Parkway, and that kind of thing. Um, with Mr. Eiler kind of assuming the school safety specialist role, um, those are the conversations that we're kind of going to be having as we kind of sum up uh, those recommendations from the committee. Then at that point, uh, we'll still be that conduit to some of those parties, including the police. Um, but yeah, I agree with you that the, uh, that information can very well be relayed to the police department in order to kind of help them be part of the process. We welcome it. Um, and, and in terms of kind of the ability to kind of, you know, share with the community what that safe route might be versus another route, um, I know that at some of the transportation committees, or previously to the transportation committee being established, at some of the conversations that I had with parents, uh, especially some, some routes that you normally wouldn't think that's potentially being hazard that parents had some concerns about. Uh, and that's all part, like I said, that's all part of the committee's kind of work as it dictates um, towards a hazardous route policy. And, and hopefully, you know, the, the information that we have from the data from some of the reports that you mentioned, the, from the information that we get from the community in terms of what the expectation should be could kind of drive that, that dialogue. Thank you. Leave the floor open to the public comments first, and we'll circle back on new business or unfinished. Is that okay? It's just a quick follow-up. If I remember correctly, I think the police departments, the chiefs of both police departments, walk those routes with Mr. Oppengard. And so there was, I know, almost continual <laughs> communication, at least that was my impression. I don't know if it was necessarily the police chiefs, but, it, but I know that Mr. Opegard had very good relationships with both uh, traffic officials from both municipalities. Uh, so I would not put it past them that, they, that someone from the police department was involved in having that conversation. I know that prior to us making the recommendations last year uh, pertaining to the hazardous route and the subscription busing, uh, that there was definitely police involvement in kind of establishing and, and kind of reinforcing that. But like I said, um, you know, I could also understand where they, they look at the traffic patterns and they look at the, the traffic kind of information. And uh, to Mr. Bond's point, anything that we can do to kind of help them support them in, uh, in terms of how they kind of designate their resources, I'm more than glad we will do that. Any other public comments relating to the agenda? Seeing none, we'll take action on agenda items, please, Mr. Ferreira. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we'll start off with curriculum instruction. Uh, Mr. Ahern? Yes. Mr. Brittingham? Yes. Dr. Laney? Yes. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Ms. Martinez? Yes. Ms. Nappy? Yes. Ms. Esposito? Yes. Ms. Gentili? Uh, related to the one item on the travel agenda that I'm on, uh, I'm staying on that. Everything else, yes. Oh, same for me for the travel agenda. Thank you. Got it. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, special Ed? Um, Mr. Ahern? Yes. Mr. Branaham? Yes. Dr. Laney? Yes. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Ms. Martinez? Yes. Ms. Nappy? Yes. Ms. Esposito? Yes. Ms. Gentili? Yes. Thank you. 
personnel with the minor revision that Mr. Liebman uh, spoke of. Um, Mr. Ahern? Yes. Mr. Brinham? Yes. Dr. Delaney? Yes. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Ms. Martinez? Yes. Ms. Nappy? Yes. Ms. Esposito? Yes. Ms. Gentile? Yes. Policy uh, with the exclusion of motion 7510 to table uh, pursuant to the board discussion. Uh, Mr. Ahern? Yes. Mr. Brinham? Yes. Dr. Delaney? Yes. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Ms. Martinez? Yes. Ms. Nappy? Yes. Ms. Esposito? Yes. Ms. Gentile? Yes. Okay, thank you. And finance uh, with the walk with the revisions um, as noted to the, um, the change orders and the contract for Cliffwood, as well as the walk ins for m number 17 and number 18. Mr. Ahern? Yes. Mr. Brinham? Yes. Dr. Delaney? Yes. Ms. Friedman? Yes. Ms. Martinez? Yes. Ms. Nappy? Yes, with the exception of item 14, to which I abstain. Thank you. Ms. Esposito? Yes. Ms. Gentile? Yes. Thank you. Any unfinished business before the board? Mrs. Gentile. Ms. Nappy? Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to revisit the lunch um, policy piece and ask a couple of clarifying questions. I appreciate, uh, Mr. Ferreira, your talking about all of that, and I also want to say that my understanding of the genesis of this, it may be marred by the fact that I missed the spring meetings for um, my son's graduation and different uh, personal events, but I, I do want to just clarify what I think I heard here tonight. Um, what, I, what I'm hearing is that there will be some changes to the procedures uh, that go along with the policy as they were presented to us originally. And specifically, what I think I heard was that ch the one change to the procedure, the main change to the procedure is that we will now not be pulling children out of the lunch line. Is that what I heard? Well, the, all right, so, so the, the procedure the procedure that was um, shared with the board uh, subject to the conversations that I had with the administration, specifically the principals, um, hasn't changed. Um, so the intent is not uh, to uh, address that with a student on a daily basis and pull them from the lunch line. The intent is to allow the student that flexibility and consequently in the event that the student requires it in a full call to the parent then consequently that's, that's to happen on, on the real-time basis, so not after. Okay, so you said the procedure is not going to change, but, you, but what you just said after that is that the procedure is going to change. So which is it? Are we pulling the kids out of the lunch line or are we not pulling them out of the lunch line? Because that's what it says in the, in the procedure that goes with the policy that you distributed to us. It says that the child will not get the lunch, mm -hmm which as I indicated at the last meeting, also then means that once they hand the child the food, right, now they can't resell the food. So that food's going in the garbage. And that's my understanding. Mm -hmm. I could be incorrect. And, and then we were going to take the child off the lunch line, the, not the, well, the middle school child um, or the high school child and have them go to the principal's office. So what I'm trying to understand is, is that still the case or is that now not the case? Okay, so the procedure calls for that if the student walks through the, through the cafeteria and the student realizes that they don't have enough money, they are to go to the main office and contact their parents. But the student's not going to know that they don't have enough money until they get to the checkout line. Oh. And that's my point. And, so and is that I, the point at which the student gets sent down to the principal's office? They're not, they're not necessarily sent down to the principal's office because the intent is that the, the principal takes a proactive approach to address that with those, child, those children before that happens. In the event, the example that you gave, that in the event that the student actually goes through the lunch line and realizes at the checkout that they don't have enough money, then at that point the, the, money, the food gets put over to the side, the principal addresses that with that child however they see fit, including issuing them a one-day pass, and then that student eats. Okay, so thank you for clarifying that. So I think that 
what what I I am having trouble what I had trouble with at the last meeting I know I expressed it uh, then and, and I am expressing it again is that uh, and I heard Mrs. Gentile say that this is the intention that we do not want to put children in the middle of this so I you know understand what you're saying that the intent would be that prior to that happening that the principals would be able to get out in front of it and um, and preempt that from happening by having a conversation with the child. But the way that the policy is currently written, it's, it's a zero balance issue. So if you owe 50 cents and you get to that register, you, you are going to be told you can't charge and, you, and, and, then, and then so some go somewhere or something happens. And so to get this one time pass from the principal. And I think the issue that I have is that, I, I, one, I can't imagine how it's going to be possible for these principals to get out in front of that. And two, then how do we then consistently implement that? Because then you're now once again saying, well, if it's only 50 cents, we'll let them go. You know, it, it, I just think that it would be great if we could maybe take another look at this, at this policy because the intention, I think, for all of us is we don't want kids who owe lots and lots of money to be able to continue charging, and parents do need to take responsibility, but at the same time, I'm uncomfortable with the idea that we have to potentially put a child in a very uncomfortable situation, and I don't want, for myself, I don't want to be in a situation where I'm putting, a as a board member, where I've endorsed something where we're putting children in the middle or we're embarrassing children. And any time that you have to tell a child to give their tray of food back and come out of a lunch line, we are embarrassing children. And that is simply just not okay with me. I am not comfortable with it, and I can't, I, I, I understand what you're saying. Hopefully they'll get out in front of it and be proactive, but there's nothing to say that that isn't going to happen where five or six kids aren't gonna end up at the register who owe $3. And, and the policy supports that action, so I'm, I'm, I'm quite concerned. I don't want to contradict what you're saying. So, so the policy, basically, that the board passed uh, talks about kind of not allowing charging at all. So to your example about having 50 cents in the, in the balance or having $3 in the balance, that wouldn't even take place. Um, because there, there is no charging at all. Uh, so basically the intent is that as the child is coming through the lunch line, um, and like I said, the, the idea is that the principals get out in front of it, be proactive about it, look at the master eligibility lists for last year, look at the master eligibility list for this year, provide the support to the parents and the kids that require it, and consequently if Johnny just happens to one day forget his lunch money, then at that point somebody's there, there's a mechanism mm -hmm. within the principal's mm -hmm. uh, arsenal mm -hmm. to be able to provide that child that one day pass. It doesn't prevent that conversation from happening. You, you know, the charging will, will still take place, to your point, it'll still take place, but it won't be charged to the specific student's account. It will be temporarily charged to the uh, district account as the principal sees fit. The idea is that it involves a much more real-time conversation between the parents and the principals, uh, because if Johnny becomes a chronic um, issue, then the principal knows that he's got to step up in terms of the support that is provided that student and that family, potentially. Um, so as a result of that, um, like I said, it's not going to be a situation where children are going to go hungry, children are going to be denied food. That, that is, the intent is to provide the needs of the child at that point as opposed to letting days, weeks, or even months of balances accrue, which has happened for, for years. Um, so like I said, is there going to be a situation where one student is going to go through the line and say, yeah, I thought I had enough money, and consequently, you know, five minutes later, they get to the end of the line and they realize that, and then at that point, the principal gives them one they pass? Yes, that is, that's the intent of it, is to address the need right there. Now. If a principal feels that that situation is happening on a recurring basis, then like I said, there, there has to be other steps that need to kind of be involved. 
Um, and I've had conversations with multiple parents over the last week and a half where they kind of see um, <coughs> both sides of the issue and consequently they, they feel that if the principals um, are going to take this matter seriously and trying to attack it from a proactive manner that they, that they are entrusting the principals to do that. Is it going to happen every single time and is it going to be perfect every single time? No, I can't guarantee that. But having the principals kind of have that discussion and with that parent on, an, on a real-time basis is a lot more practical than waiting weeks or months down the road. Thank you. And just to follow up, I think point well taken, there won't be a negative, but if the child only has 50 cents left on their account, when they get to the cashier, if the principal has not preempted that, they're going to be set told, no, you can't charge and and the principal is then going to have to make the phone call or give the temporary cheese sandwich or whatever it is pass so is the principal going to be in the lunch line for every lunch period is that what that's going to look like I, I mean i'm not trying to be difficult but like I, I work in a school so i know what it looks like in a lunch room in a lunch line a principal's office a typical school day i'm just trying to envision how this is going to look in real time i mean Ideally, I guess at 8 a.m., the principal every single day is going to have to make sure everybody is spoken to before lunch periods start. Ideally. I hear your point. And I, I think one of the things that when we were, uh, Mr. Ferrer was talking earlier, there are a lot more things that we need to explore, like that low balance alert and those order replenishment opportunities and a transition to a new payment system. There's um, a lot more that we can do on this end to make the process work better for um, for all involved. Um, but yes, there is. I agree with you. There's that, that concern as to what that looks like and what that impact is on, on principals. And I think, you know, um, there's work that we can do collectively. And um, I think I, part of the message is to get to parents because I, I find it, you know, kind of tough to put. Um, principal resources on this task also. And I would hope that families um, would understand that that's, you know, not the most, you know, um, conducive use of their time, or, um, principal time. So I, I think um, it's tough. You know, we've tried some other measures and, 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 and made very little or no progress. And I'm not sure that, um, like I said, I have concerns too, and I, a lot of the board has expressed concerns as we were developing this conversation as to what it would look like to the child. And um, you know, the, the you know, the, it's, you know, the child can have two dollars in his account and goes to George's lunch, and it's two fifty-five, and he'll be fifty-five cents short. And um, you know, one of the things that I, when I was talking to Mr. Ferreira, mm -hmm. is that you know, building principles will use level-headed and um, common-sense approaches and um, have some flexibility in, in what that looks like. Um, but I, I don't think we're done. I think, like Mr. Ferreira said, we have to see what this, you know, he's got the 30-day um, pre and reduced serving um, clock um, built in there for some students. And so we have to see what that looks like going into October. But um, do I think we're finished? That's absolutely not. I agree with you. I think, um, you know, we're trying to find a way forward to, to, to it's, it's for all those who pay their bills and cover their kids' lunches. You know, we owe them something, too. They're, you know. Um, not running a deficit in the district and for the district to be at the end of the school year trying to collect 33,000 is not a good position to be in either. So, um, you know, the, the concerns you've expressed and, and the, the concerns that the board has expressed too um, all have to factor into how this, um, how this works in the building. So, um, it's not sure. ideal, but um, I, I have, you know, confidence that, uh, you know, we will be level-headed and we will, um, you know, do the right, be able to do this effectively without, you know, hurting a child in the process. Ms. Martinez? Sorry, thank you. Um, I just want to, Alex, I just want to ask, um, we, you know, needless to say, this has been exhausting conversations for years. I mean, this, I'm going into my sixth year and we've always talked about the lunch. Um, and again, no, no policy is perfect. There's going to be problems. There's going to be flaws. I can already imagine and or see it. Um, my question is this. So the kids that are, have high arrears or any arrears right now, I mean, obviously quite a few kids represent $33,000. We are assuming, 
and, and I can only assume that we're not going to collect all that money by September 7th, okay? So when these kids come into school to get lunch, they're in arrears already walking in the door. So how are they going to eat as far as not going, you know, again, with the resources like Ms. Gentile said with the principals? Um, it, it really makes me very uncomfortable and nervous to think that what a principal has to handle in the day and this be his focus. It makes me insane that he would have to deal with a lunch balance, um, especially the high school and the middle school with the age of the kids and, and security and safety. That is the last thing I, I want a principal to deal with. So, and, and again, on the other hand, I know that they have to get involved at some point. Um, what happens to those kids that come in with high balances already starting this year and they go up to the lunch line and we haven't gotten the money from the parents? What does that look like? Uh, the students that accrued balances over the course of the last couple of years are not going to be treated any differently than any other students. Um, so consequently, when they get up to the line, if they have money to make their purchase, they're going to complete their purchase. Uh, if they're not, then at that point, the principal is, is, or designee is going to get involved and address the, the situation with the parent. Um, in the meantime, um, the board, you know, as we kind of go through this over the next month or so, uh, because the balances are starting to come down. So in June, it was 32,142. Um, um, the last report that um, we ran in the business office on August 20th, that number was at 23,841. Um, so. I'm not necessarily expecting the number to be zero uh, within the next month or two or even the last next year, but at some point, especially as we kind of wrap up the audit, um, the, our, the auditor is going to basically ask me to kind of go to the board and see what we want to agree, address with reference to that liability. Um, so consequently, at that point, the board might choose to basically come up with a process that says, okay, the following, you know, um, folks, because of the excess balance of X, um, we're going to continue and go on through the collections process, and then everybody else below that, we're going to basically just liquidate and write off. Um, so that, you know, as, as, as this develops over the next month or so, uh, and I update the board um, on what, how those balances are proceeding, um, then at that point the board will kind of have the opportunity to do uh, something to that nature. But in terms of the individual students coming through the lunch line, whether they have a zero balance or they have a negative balance based upon an accrual from previous years, they're not going to be treated any different. Uh, thank you, Alex. Um, and when you said liquidated, when we get to that point, is that information, are we going to discuss that because that also is bothersome to me? When, when parents know that we're going to liquidate their account, then what's the sense of pay? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I have some numbers now that I could share with the board um, that basically, you know, about 48% of the folks um, have $10 balance or more, and about 52% have less than $10 in their balance. And that's out of, of a sample size of 407 students. Um, so as you can see, the, the spectrum is kind of broad because from $10 and above goes all the way to six, $700. Um, so yes, um, as, as we kind of, as we go through this, I'm gonna kind of keep a running tab that as, as, as I run these reports and have an Excel spreadsheet in terms of what those numbers look like in terms of specific bands of, uh, of uh, outstanding balance. And then hopefully, you know, the intent is that um, we try to kind of recoup as much as possible. Uh, it gets to a certain point where I think we're going to kind of plateau, and then at that point, it probably is going to line up with the audit discussion, and consequently, at that point, you know, the board will have the opportunity to uh, review that or not, and or maintain that liability and and seek more people to go to collections. Uh, that's something that the board can can review. And just one other question: Am I correct in saying that um, the balances are supposed to be paid for graduation to occur? Uh, pursu <coughs> pursuant to the previous policy um, that, that the board changed uh, expiring in, I believe, May when May or June when we wrapped that up, um, there was some, some language in there that the students were not to participate 
in extracurriculars and athletics. Um, unfortunately, I don't have data on how many of those students actually with, were withheld those opportunities as a result of a negative balance. Thank you. Ms. Chantel. And, um, Ms. Freeman. So when we were here and we passed the policy, there was a lot of back and forth and there really wasn't anybody in the audience at that point. Um, there is a practical part of this policy that I, I think you touched on when you made your opening statement in that because it's not a mandated state policy, it's within our discretion on how we enforce it, which gives us the latitude to not pick on kids or put kids in the middle of what really should be an adult situation. In saying that, um, I had brought up at the last meeting, I was one of those parents with a 40 cent arrearage on my son. And with that, I brought up some practical points that my understanding is the administration is taking on as possible issues with linking a brother-sister account in some fashion. Um, one of the issues is that we would be notified after we were in arrears as opposed to a low balance. And I say we were notified understanding that my child probably got something at school and didn't bring it back. I'm a believer that the kid should start taking ownership of it and remembering to give me that red slip so that he doesn't eat the cheese sandwich as we used to do, but has something. Um, certainly not to the point where we're embarrassing the, the child. The other issue that I've noticed is that some of the higher balances are from people who receive subsidized food or lunches, some free lunch. So those are snacks that Chartwells is allowing them to take. And that's a problem. Either that or it's a situation where, sorry to cut you off, Ms. Friedman, um, but it, it's, a, it's an actually great point uh, regarding that because I know that that's a common kind of um, concern. Either that or, and I'm not saying that that's not happening, very honestly, uh, or it's a situation where there was a lapse between the time that the student fell off of that master eligibility list, an application was not completed by that 30th serving day, and as a result of that, they started accruing that balance until the new application was submitted and processed. And I would hope, especially for the students that need it, that that gap should be fairly minimal. Uh, but I could also see a situation, and speaking to Christine in my office, that there's, there's definitely several occasions where that extension, that gap was multiple months. So as a result of that, you do that for you know, seven or eight years as you go through the, the process, and then obviously you accrue those balances uh, over the course of time. Um, and that's, you know, that's, like I said, that's one of the proactive steps that the, um, that we expect the, uh, the building-based administration is to use the resources like a guidance counselor or a nurse, that if for whatever reason that phone call from the business office was just sent to voicemail, or that phone call from the principal was sent to voicemail, maybe someone like a nurse or a guidance counselor or a case manager will have better luck in making sure that we uh, address those needs with those parents before the 30th serving day to say, hey, just come in, spend five minutes with me, I'll help you fill out the application, and then consequently there won't be that gap, and consequently that's one less student that, that we would have to worry about. Thank you. Any other unfinished business before the board? Well, we're having another public comment session coming up oh, okay. right in like two minutes. Sorry. No problem. I just want you to know you're on. Um, no one, uh, any new business before the board? No new business. Now we open the floor to public comments relating to additional matters. So please come up and name and address, please. My name is Melissa Cruz. I live on Stemler Drive. Um, I definitely can empathize with... Um, the dedication to get those funds back from the parents with regards to the lunch. But as a parent, um, a working parent, I work with patients all day. The likelihood, I've heard what happens at MAMS, the principal sometimes will be taking care of a di disciplinary situation. 
kids talk, kids make fun of each other. For my son to get to the end of the line, for them to wait for him to come and give him a daily pass if that's his discretion for the day, that's gonna call attention. That's gonna start people to get made fun of, even if it is one time. If you guys know that there's more things that you can provide to make the ease into this policy better, why not wait to enforce that policy until you set those parameters? Why do it at the expense to say, well, not everyone's gonna be happy, and yeah, we're gonna hit some rough spots, but at how many students expense? At how many working parents who work in Manhattan that have to make a payment and it takes 24 hours if it's via credit card to hit? You all are parents as well you all can be in that predicament where your child might have just ordered extra. Why not wait to enforce the policy? Get the reminder thing going. Get any other ability to go before you start to create this opportunity for shaming one kid to another the way we all know realistically they're going to go. I think in terms of the timing of it, uh, Ms. Cruz, um, I think it was a situation where the board passed the policy in the spring. Uh, we didn't want to do it, uh, not only logistically, we were not prepared to do it based upon the interaction, the conversations with the principals, uh, but it, it was an opportunity to kind of have a fresh start come uh, the new school year, particularly because of the master eligibility list in terms of the free and reduced uh, students and that kind of uh, waiting period of the 30 days. Um, so as a result of that, I think that that was kind of the intent. It was that it was kind of a fresh start and be able to kind of manage that. Um, I can tell you that we're having an admin training <coughs> tomorrow with the principals, and this is going to be a topic of conversation um, to make sure that they feel comfortable that they can address it. They've expressed to me that, yes, there was some hesitation, but they've expressed to me that they have a process uh, in place at each of the buildings on how they are going to handle it. Is it going to be foolproof? No. Um, and I think to your point, Ms. Cruz, um, the idea is that we try to kind of minimize the impact on the students. Um, I can also tell you that, you know, the other stuff that we're kind of looking at in terms of low balance warnings and auto replenishments and stuff like that, that's going to come anyway. Um, there's a timing component to that based upon the, uh, the fact that you really can't run two systems concurrent. So at some point, we're going to have to cut that off, whether it be a month from now, whether it be two or three months from now. Uh, so I'll have that informa more information from that to the community and the board as it becomes available. So there's, like I said, there's other factors. Uh, as parents, and I'll, I'll give you my perfect example, I have two little girls, and I put some money on their account. Uh, they don't buy lunch every day, but I send money with them every day to buy lunch if they choose to, and they always have that emergency file <coughs> bill in that envelope. Uh, I'm not saying that that's what everybody needs to do, but every household can address it however they see fit. I don't think it's ever going to be a situation where we can address every single scenario and every single situation that could possibly come from a household. That's why um, the intent is that the principals have that <coughs> flexibility to deal with it on, on an ongoing basis based upon what they see that's happening in their buildings. And like I said, I've seen this happen um, at the high school level with minimal interaction. At a, at a very big high school district. Um, at the elementary level, I don't see as much of a risk, but I could be wrong because, like I said, they're pre-ordering stuff. Um, but at Lloyd Road in the middle school, you know, the, the idea is that we provide support to both of those principals to kind of give them the flexibility to handle their situation as they see fit. Uh, and if it's a situation where during the first couple of months those one-day passes kind of accrue a little bit more than we anticipate, so be it. Um, that's something that, that we're prepared, like Ms. Gentile said, to come back to the board and kind of revisit those discussions as we see fit. So in the case where the school year commences and you enforce this policy and all of a sudden plans don't go as expected and kids do get stopped and their trays get pulled at the front of the line, how many children is it going to take for you to revisit that the policy needs revisiting or revision? The policy itself would kind of have to go through the policy process, but uh, to Ms. Friedman's point before about kind of the regulation and or the procedure not necessarily having to get bo uh, board approved, um, it would be something that we would hear feedback from not only parents as well as principals <coughs> probably, the, probably within the first couple of hours. 
Uh, so at that point, like I said, if we need to kind of revisit it, we'll, we'll revisit it in, re in, in a real-time kind of fashion. The only thing I would add, Oops, though, sorry. I'm sorry, there's one thing I'd like to add. Um, many times you do fast and hard, you do get unintended consequences, and, and there's nobody on this board that wants to see an unintended consequence happen to a child. Um, we have tried this um, policy approach to, to try to keep that balance from getting to where it is, but I can, uh, I, I, I can say this um, with this team and this board. Um, if, 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 if things go off kilter very quickly, we're going to have to have this conversation. It's not cut in stone, and we're going to have to be ready to be able to um, you know, move at a moment's notice, whether it means you know, taking a step back or um, taking a second look at it sooner than we think you know, um, you know, that, that two to, uh, one to two month period. Um, you know, we, 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 you know, we're a community, and this is a board, and we represent um, our families, and this team cares about kids. So um, I, I, I know with my fellow board mates, we, we get a little concerned, too, with this hard and fast approach. And I can assure you, and I, you know, we've worked together for quite a few years, that if we see some consequences, unintended consequences, and, and they're having an impact on children, we are not, we're going to have to do something in that moment. I, I just, we have to. You know, that's what this board has been saying through this thing. Yes, we have a policy, but we had that policy and we got nowhere with it. So we've seen attempts where we've tried to do something and make an impact and it didn't work. Same goes with this policy. If there's an impact that we don't like either, which is the effect on a child, you know, this has to be something we do in, in, in that time and in that moment. We can't, we can't. I agree, you know, the board fully agrees, we, you know. There are children involved, and we have to be able to, um, you know, be effective and, and, and administer a policy and do it in a way that does not impact a child. So uh, I, from the board's perspective, we have to have that wiggle room to be able to, like you said, you know, not have an unintended impact. So we have to leave that open for conversation. Tiffany Stevenson, St. Joe Terrace, the Foogie. Um, to Ms. Nappy's point, um, to Ms. Nappy's point, um, are the principals going to be in the lunchroom all day long? Because um, I am a fellow educator. Um, I know how crazy the school day can be. Um, I'm just envisioning students waiting constantly. And as it's already been pointed out, as they're waiting, students will be making fun of them because everyone will know exactly what is going on. Um, I think that's, from that standpoint, Ms. Stevenson, similar to the conversation that we had this afternoon and kind of talking about some of these, like, uh, concerns. Um, I think that's one of the ones that I think is going to be somewhat building specific based upon the number of periods, based upon how the principal designates uh, that responsibility to specific people in the building, uh, whether it be a main office secretary, a nurse, uh, someone that's covering lunch, whatever the case may be. So that's the piece that I think is going to be spelled out a little bit uh, based upon the, um, the actual needs of the building. Mm -hmm. And consequently, mm -hmm. the intent is that that information gets communicated to parents, um, you know, at the start of the school year, so that his parents know exactly what that expectation is. So I can't say that, you know, from that standpoint, that the principal is going to be in the lunchroom every single <coughs> period of every single day. I don't think that's realistic, uh, but I think that they'll put the processes in place to be able to address and support those kids um, as as the need arises. Um, as our um, conversation this afternoon. Um, you had pointed out that this would, by having students in the elementary school um, place their orders ahead of time, um, that would give the principal um, a little bit more time to stay on top of this. However, um, Lloyd Road or older, they don't have that opportunity. So um, even if a high school student comes up, yes, they can bum a couple dollars from their friend, but that's not always possible. And um, unfortunately, I don't want to bring this up to bring sadness or anything, but we have a severe bullying problem in our country that has often led to suicide. 
And little things like this might be consequential to many of you, but these things are what leads many of these students and teenagers to make these drastic decisions because they're friends or they hear others making fun of them. Now, it might only be that they're short 25 cents, but like you said, maybe there's something else going on at home, but we don't know that. And it takes a while to know that. And maybe we might never know that until it's too late. I think that this policy, while I understand getting back your thousands of dollars is very important, especially as a taxpayer, who I'm also concerned about busing and other issues, I don't feel that our resources should be used to be having principals and other staff members standing up there um, making sure that students get lunch or they don't get lunch or parents are called. And I don't feel that the students should be involved at all. If they're waiting for a principal to come or someone else, they are involved. They are now aware that their parents do not have the money. They should not need to know that. Mrs. Stevenson, I could tell you that, you know, like I said, um, it's, it's, we've tried policy before. We've had some success. We haven't had any success, and there are concerns. The board still has concerns, and, um, you know, the community input is very important, and um, it, we'll, there'll be further conversations about it. Well, once again, as it's been brought up, why is this policy in place if you all still have concerns? It should not be in place. I understand it would, might have meant that more thousands of dollars be racked up, but until you have a concrete plan to make sure that students are not put in the middle of this, you should not have put this policy in place. And I think that I am gravely disappointed in all of you. And I will remind you that we vote for you. And the community as a whole is very upset about this. We understand, and like I said, we, it's, you know, something that w it's going to be a continual. So I, how I, many students have to be put in this position, and how many newspapers have to get told and media get involved before you decide this policy is not going to work? Because we've seen headlines of students didn't get lunch because they didn't have 40 cents. Um, I can tell you, Ms. Stevenson, that uh, the board has a COW on September 12th, uh, excuse me, September 13th, and I expect to have a report from each of the principals as to what transpired during that Thursday and Friday um, pertaining to lunches uh, in the buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, then at that point, if the board wants to, to revisit it, they're welcome to do so. Um, but in terms of kind of the procedure and in terms of is, the, is it perfect and everything ironed out, uh, I think, like I said, there's, there's enough um, in the process, uh, in the policy as intended by the board and the concerns that the board has expressed, um, but also kind of on a way to move forward and the safety nets that there are in place in order to provide the support to the students um, and hopefully that, like I said, the intent is to tackle those on a proactive basis. Mm -hmm. So like this, we minimize exactly the concerns that you have. Will parents be given the initial phone calls um, for low balances before the school starts as a reminder that they have a low balance? Uh, yes. So we're actually, like I said um, this afternoon, the, communi the initial communication uh, was just to kind of advise the, the, the parent community that the policy is changing. Um, there's gonna be other communications both from the business office and the intent is that there's gonna be other more specific communications as it pertains to the procedure in the individual building from each of the principals uh, prior to the start of the school day. Ms. Gentile, I, just uh, a point of information. It, the meeting I just checked is September 12th. It's a Wednesday. Any other public comments? All right. Mrs. Gentile, if I may, can we, I understand that there's going to be a meeting tomorrow um, to discuss the implementation of this or a training tomorrow, Mr. Ferrara said. Is it possible for the board to get 
some greater level of specificity of what the procedure will then look like at MAMS and the high school, at Lloyd Road and MAMS and the high school prior to the start of the school year. Um, I think I, I hear what you're saying, but I cannot envision what you're saying without more specifics. Can you relay that information to us? Absolutely. Um, I can't, we're, tomorrow we're covering several topics during admin training, so I can't say specifically that it's going to be defined tomorrow, but uh, definitely before the start of the, um, the school year, uh, that information will be relayed to the board. And, it, oh, and I think it's important that the community sentiment and concerns that they've expressed about how this is going to impact a child has to be part of that conversation and well understood that, um, you know, that we're not going to have, you know, an adverse consequence. It's, it, uh, you know, the board has had this conversation as we developed it since the spring. It's the same conversation that we've had um, concerns with. And, um, you know, I, I think there's some concern that we have to work through. It's, you know, it's an issue. Ms. Gentile? Ms. Martinez? Can I just comment that I just want parents to realize we don't have to wait for the next board meeting if we want to make any changes um, because we've done that via email and surveyed each other. So if this comes up that we need to make a change immediately, it doesn't have to be the two meetings a month. So am I correct in saying that? Because we've done that before. Well, I, I, we have to let Mr. Um, Ferreira have that conversation with the building principals and let them talk this through and let Mr. Ferreira bring this, um, the board concern to this conversation and the community concern and, um, you know, get a, a read back on what that looks like. But, right. No, um, I just I just want the public to understand that it doesn't have to be just the two meeting month that we can talk in between if need be and make a change. Like we said, this isn't mandated, so we do have that flexibility. Yeah, flexibility, you know? yes. I appreciate it. Um, be it resolved that a closed session I'm sorry. Be it resolved that a closed session be convened for the purpose of discussing privacy matters, personnel matters, um, litigation update, negotiation matters, and security matters. The subject matter of these discussions will be disclosed to the public when the reason for confidentiality subsides. Although the board cannot guarantee it, the length of executive session is estimated to be 60 minutes, after which the public meeting of the board shall reconvene and proceed with business. Action will not take place. May I have a motion to enter executive session? I'll make a motion. May I have a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are in executive session.